all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. Good afternoon and welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, CW2 type Army aviator in 1969. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I'm really excited to have you here today. We've got a great guest up coming up. We're going to be talking all about President Dwight Eisenhower, and um, it's a cool book. It's really a cool book. It's called I Can Love in War, so it's going to get very exciting as we get along through there. Um, the guest is Richard Streiner. He is a retired professor at Washington College. He's written many books about Lincoln, especially seems to concentrate a lot on Republican presidents. We'll see how we can go with that when we bring him on um, in a little while. And then we've got uh, Steve Rose. Steve is from uh, Fisher House, Michigan, and we're going to be talking about them finally breaking ground at the Fisher House in Detroit. So stick around for those. Those are going to be the guests that we've got today. Um, before we get into the actual program, I want to make sure that we always thank our sponsors. We can't do this without them, and we can't do this without you. So number one, of course, is Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans has specialized in veterans' disability claims. Uh, give them a call at Legal Help for Veterans, uh, 800-693-4800. Or for more information, you can go to LegalHelpForVeterans.com. The National Veterans De- Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, is the nation's leading third-party authority for certification of a veteran-owned business. Do you want to do g- business with the government and you're veteran-owned? you got to be certified. These are the folks that can do it for you. For more information, you can go to their websites, that's nvbdc.org, or give them a call at 888-237-8433. The Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For more information, you can go to their website, that's va.gov slash Ann Arbor Healthcare. And a new sponsor today is Residential Home Health and Hospice Care for Veterans and their Families. For more information about them, you can go to residentialhealthcaregroup.com or call them at 866-902-5854. That's 866-902-5854. It's Residential Home Health and Hospice Care for Veterans. We have a whole program dedicated to our new sponsor coming up next week, so make sure you tune in next week at that time. We also want to make sure that we thank our local veterans organizations without whom we would never have gotten this program off the ground. Uh, it's Irwin Prescorn, American Legion, Post 46, and the Charles S. Kettles, Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 310, both of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay, and that's the official part of the program out of the way. All right, so joining me right now on the line is Stephen Rose, and Stephen is the um, outreach coordinator for Fisher House, Michigan. So Stephen, welcome to Veterans Radio. Dale, thank you so much for having me on. Extremely happy to be here with you. Well, it's always good to talk to folks from Fisher House. We, um, you know, we've we've got this nice relationship going with you folks. You know, you help us out, we help you out, of course. So, uh, just for a review for our audience, can you tell us what Fisher House is about and actually what it is? Yeah. So, I know a lot of the listeners definitely know about Fisher House and Fisher House Machine and what we do. Uh, for those who don't. Uh, Short and simple, think of us as the Ronald McDonald House for veterans and their families. So we build and kind of maintain comfort homes at VA facilities across the state of Michigan and uh, throughout the United States. And at those locations, we offer free lodging, food, support services, pretty much anything that a family could need, either financially or emotionally, while they are being that advocate and loved one there with their veteran who's receiving care through the VA. Uh, We're going to go ahead and take care of that. Because there's obviously more important things than, you know, wondering, you know, where, how am I going to pay for this hotel? Where's my next meal coming from? It's, it should really be, you know, they're changing my dad's medication. Why is this, why is this happening? Why did they delay my mom's surgery? So we're trying to take care of everything that way they can focus on their, their veteran and their loved one, getting them healthy and getting them back up. Well, I know that it's, uh, as I said, this is a great organization. It's been around for a while. How did, how did Fisher House get started? So it was, Late 80s, early 90s, uh, Zachary and Elizabeth Fisher were the keynote um, guest of Admiral Trost at Bethesda Medical Center uh, right there in D.C. And 
you know, at one point of the tour, uh, the Admiral's wife, Paul, uh, Pauline, pulled Zachary's wife, Elizabeth, aside, took her to the parking lot of the medical center and said, you know, Elizabeth, I need you to take a peek here and, and see what's going on because we have a problem. And, you know, Elizabeth's kind of looking around and she she's like, well, is there a parade coming? She goes, oh, I need you to really take a look and look at some of the vehicles. And, you know, there were families sleeping inside of their cars, A, because, you know, they you can't really get a hotel short notice in DC. And if you can, good luck paying for it. But as well, they didn't want to be far from their loved one. So the, the five minute walk from the parking lot to, to the bedside was, was too much, let alone a, a 45 minute drive across DC. So a few weeks later, Zachary, you know, found himself in front of Congress and, you know, he laid it out, you know, you guys have a problem and I want to fix it. And, you know, this is a part of the man who, who built the New York skyline. So, when Congress came back and said, well, write us a check and we'll, we'll get the building. He said, no, no, no. He's, you know, if I can't open my home specifically to these families and these veterans, I'm going to build them a home like mine. So since then, uh, Fisher House Foundation has built 96 across, across the world. So we have two in Germany, one in England. Uh, we're quickly approaching the road to 100, which is an extremely exciting time. You know, Ann Arbor was Michigan's first Fisher House. It was house number 87. Um, opened June 1st of 2020. Since then, it's housed 4,265 families and 8,116 individuals. Wow. Um, so we're really, really proud to be able to say that, you know, fiscal year 23 just closed and they were the third busiest Fisher house, uh, in operation. So you they know, sat just that. Do you say that the third busiest Fisher house? Really? Absolutely. So, you know, in, in a short amount of time, it has become one of the, the quickest and busiest houses in the United States. Uh, it sat just at 80% for fiscal year 23, which just closed. And last month actually was its busiest uh, occupancy. It sat at 98%, which also included 27 nights of overflow lodging. So because it's a relatively small facility, there's 16 private family suites. We do quite often have families coming in when the house is full. And, you know, the best part about Fisher House, Michigan, and uh, it's, it's what would Zach do? Zach would Zach would find a way to say you have to help these families. So if the house is full, we go ahead and cover the hotel bill for these families that are coming in from out of town, out of state. That way, they they know they're being taken care of still. Wow, uh, that that's terrific. I didn't realize that they I didn't realize they were that busy. Well, then it's a good thing that we have another one that we can start talking about a little bit. Uh, down the road a piece toward Detroit, we now have um, Michigan Fisher House number two. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so in 2018, actually out of cycle, you know, uh, Detroit was approved for a Fisher House and it's been a bit of a challenge getting land, but uh, January 3rd, of uh, this year, the VA did acquire land. So the property is going to be located at 7618 Woodward Ave. So those of us proud Michiganders here, you know, we know Woodward Ave is the most iconic drive in the state of Michigan. And we're proud to be building Michigan's second Fisher House. Two weeks ago, actually, the Garzinski group got on site and they broke ground. They started moving dirt for site remediation. Uh, we're going to be doing the exact same things in Detroit that we're doing in Ann Arbor. So lodging, food, support services, anything that those families are going to need, uh, we're going to go ahead and take care of so they can focus on their loved one, on their families, getting them back, getting them healthy and getting them back home. Uh, we are still kind of in the middle of this, this capital fundraising campaign for it. So the Detroit build is estimated to cost about $10 million. So we've raised about $4 million so far in, in, in capital, and we're, we're looking to go ahead and raise the rest of that so we can uh, fully finance the, the cost of of construction as well as support for the house um really looking forward to opening up uh that facility because you know like i said ann arbor was the third third busiest house in, in the nation last year and all signs are pointing that detroit is going to be just as busy you know between the two facilities here in southeast michigan we're going to offer eleven thousand six hundred eighty nights of lodging food, support services uh, to families coming in from all over the world, really. Um, to kind of point back at just how impactful that Ann Arbor house has been so far, uh, they have housed families from 26 different states, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Canada, Mexico, France, and Australia. So 
We're a small local organization, but, you know, we're casting a really big net in terms of the individuals that we're able to help. And Detroit's just going to allow us to get that many more families and veterans access to their care and keeping that core family unit together and really allowing these families to get the quality care that they deserve off through the VA. All right. Well, so uh, supposing that I wanted to donate some money, how would I go about doing that, Stephen? So easy, easy way to donate, uh, fisherhousemichigan.org. Uh, there's multiple ways to give. If you want to join Zach's Club and make it a monthly recurring donation, uh, we can do mail checks through our P.O. box, which is listed on our website. Uh, as well, if you wanted to give us a follow on social media, we're at Fisher House Mish on all major uh, social media platforms. We have ways to donate through there as well. Um, for those who don't necessarily have the ability to make a financial donation, if you wanted to do a donation of your time, uh, we have at the Ann Arbor House, we have our meal train. So we open up about, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays right now. We open up to the community. We let individuals and organizations do home cooked meals for the families. Uh, gives them the opportunity to get into the facility, see what they're really supporting, see the families firsthand, break bread with them, and, and remind those families that the community is really who is there supporting and and, and there behind them. Uh, it's, it, well, as I started off, these are really great organizations. One thing I wanted to point out is that Fisher House itself, once the building is built, they turn the keys over to the VA. Absolutely. So... It is a wonderful relationship between the public and the private uh, private sector. Obviously, we are a private 501c3 nonprofit. So we raise the funds, the capital, build the house, uh, and we do it to a standard that we are proud to be able to offer dwelling and, and residency to our, our veterans and, and families. Uh, and upon completion, yes, we do. We gift everything, uh, the keys right over to the VA. Uh, the VA staffs it with a, a manager, assistant manager, and a housekeeping team. And then Fisher House Michigan is able to stay very tightly woven into the fabric of that team and anything that the house needs, be it, uh, you know, countertop, uh, refrigerators for medication, or if there's holiday meals coming up that they want catered, we're able to go ahead and not have as much red tape as the government in terms of getting our funds to the families to support the mission firsthand. Um, and, you know, the VA in Ann Arbor are, are fantastic about that. And, you know, the VA in Detroit has absolutely done their due, di due diligence. You know, they've already hired a manager. They're already sending her off to get training at other VA facilities that have Fisher houses. And they're really setting the VA Detroit Fisher house up for a huge amount of success. Well, I'm really excited to hear about what's going on in Detroit. I'm really proud of what, is, you know, Fisher House has been able to accomplish here in Ann Arbor. And I want to thank Stephen Rose for coming on the program today and getting us updated. So I'm sure I'll either have you or I'll have Kate back on um, later on with an update of what's happening, because I know that you're also exploring a third option in Michigan, but we're not going to tell anybody about that one yet. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, again, um, for the people that want to follow the build, uh, like I said, you know, we did just break ground, but it is going to happen very fast and furious. Uh, the Garzinski group is very, very competent, very quick with what they do. So follow us at Fisher House Mish on all the major socials, and we are going to be posting weekly updates, and it's going to be drastically changing week to week as we build Michigan's second Fisher House here in Detroit. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate your time today, and uh, good luck. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Thank you. Wait, called me, sir. I don't know. Call oh, sir a lot lately. <laughs> All right. So that was uh, Fisher House. And I encourage everybody here to go to FisherHouseMichigan.org and you know, donate your time, donate your, your, your money if you can. They have a, a great program going on there. And I know that all of the veteran service organizations in the local area have volunteer groups that go up there. I know they go up there weekly and sometimes to repair meals. Sometimes to just talk with the residents. It's a great opportunity. So that's our public relations function for today. Um, right now, I'm going to introduce our, our guest. And I think it's a kind of a cool story. Um, for those of you that don't know my age, I'm not going to tell you, but I grew up in the Eisenhower era. And I really, I, I don't know what it was about him, but I always admired him. But I never knew the whole story, you know, because, you know, I was a kid. What did I know? And um, so our, our guest that has written a book entitled Ike in Love and Wars, Richard Striner, 
And uh, Richard is joining us on the line right now. And let me give you just a little background on Richard. Uh, it says, I uh, took it from his website, which is richardsteiner.com. And he's an author, historian, public speaker, writer, historian, who's many, many fields. You, you, uh, one of his, uh, one of the nation's foremost Lincoln scholars. This is for a whole other program because that's another guy that always fascinated me. Um, I guess to get to the main point, is that he is a retired uh, professor at um, Washington College in, in Maryland, and he now devotes himself full-time to writing books, public speaking, and consulting. And right now he's joining us here on Veterans Radio. So, Richard, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you, Dale. Can you hear me all right? One never knows with this technology nowadays. Yes, I, I, surprisingly, everything seems to be working today. Oh, well, good. And I can hear you. I hope that you can hear us, too. Absolutely. All right. So the book, as I mentioned, was titled Ike in Love and War. And I guess maybe the best. What made you decide to write about Ike? Well, it's a long story. I uh, did about a dozen years worth of consulting for the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial Commission. As many of your listeners uh, probably know, Congress uh, voted in 99 to build a memorial to Ike. Uh, on the National Mall. It was dedicated in 2020. It's just southwest of the National Air and Space Museum uh, on the south side of Independence Avenue. And uh, I, through networking, I I found my way to uh, the door of a uh, retired Air Force general named Carl Riddell. Um, An Air Force general with a PhD in history uh, it was not military history, but Russian history, uh, a very cosmopolitan man who chaired the history department, of the Air Force Academy for many years. He was the executive director of the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, and it was a fascinating experience. Uh, he brought me aboard to help out with uh, writing, uh, also as a consultant for deeper background on American history. Uh, but what he might have learned from me, uh, he surpassed many times over in what he taught me about Eisenhower. Uh, the uh, uh, cumulative force of Eisenhower's scholarship in the last generation and a half or so has just been prodigious. Uh, you were saying that you didn't know all that much about Ike when you were a kid. I was a kid in the 1950s, too. That's right. We were just kids. What did we know? But what did anybody know, really? Because uh, part of the fascinating and, and continuing story of, of Ike, as historians discover it, is how much this man kept deliberately hidden. Uh, it was just extraordinary. A path-breaking book on this uh, appeared in 1982, The Hidden Hand Presidency by a political scientist named Fred Greenstein. Um he opened uh, the first door. Uh, then, uh, you know, having having learned uh, how much of the Eisenhower appearance uh, was a created deception, <laughs> Eisenhower scholars began delving more deeply, you know, into the record, some of which was not yet declassified, some of it is still not declassified. But what we have found, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, he was uh, sometimes... Um, even among his admirers, regarded as as uh, a relaxed old man, not exactly past his prime, but a very different sort of persona from the the war hero who led Operation Overlord. Ike came across in his presidential years as a kind of genial grandfatherly figure, relaxed, at ease, happy. Don't you believe it? It was all a deception. He made himself appear the reverse of the way he actually was. He was often mad as a hornet. Uh, you know, those, those, those blazing eyes of his could pin you to the wall if you wasted his time. He had a terrible temper all his life that he, he struggled to tame. Uh, in some interviews just after his presidency with Walter Cronkite, the old, you know, CBS News anchorman. I, Eisenhower revealed that if you worked for him in the White House, you knew that one of your standard duties was to be called at short notice or no notice into the Oval Office, and you knew exactly what was coming. Your duty was to stand there and listen silently as he cursed a blue streak, you know, in language that would, you know, curl the hair of any red-blooded sailor and, and say nothing. 
uh, and then leave. And then he would <laughs> thank so you. He felt better. <laughs> he, yes, uh, he had to vent. But the public never knew. And and the public never knew so much about what he did. It was kept deliberately hidden for good reasons. I'm talking a blue streak. You probably want to ask me some questions. No, I was going to. I was actually. I was. I was. <laughs> I was going to go back to the beginning. I, you know, we are we are talking with Richard Streiner. His book is "I Can Love and War," which is an interesting uh, title for one thing. Um, let's go back chronologically back to, you know. Kansas. Yes. He came from when he had his, his name was reversed. That's the other thing that I thought was really interested. Uh, when he was born, he was David Dwight Eisenhower, correct? Correct. And he was, but he, he was born in Texas. Yes. Right. In and Denison, Texas. Denison, Texas. And then they moved back to Abilene, Kansas. So, so let's go back to, to Abilene and tell us a little bit about his um, early childhood. His early childhood. Um, was a very uh, complicated thing. Um, and one of the things that interested me most as I got into this biography project was trying as best I could to understand uh, the man himself, you know, what it was like to be him. We can never know exactly, but if we try, you know, to gain insights into the inner world of the people where we're studying uh, we can learn a lot depending on the quality of the evidence. And as I learned more, uh, what became especially interesting to me, among other things, was the story of his emotional development uh, and the way his uh, emotional experience in childhood led to the long-term mission that defined his his role as as a world leader, as a guardian of peace. Here you have this career soldier who, as president, gives the United States of America eight uninterrupted years of peace. And mm -hmm. not just peace, you know, on the international front, not just the avoidance of, of hot wars after he wound down the essentially unwinnable war in Korea. He avoided getting dragged into any other uh, hot wars. Uh, but keeping the peace in a new age of nuclear danger um, and keeping the peace on the domestic front because, and this is where the story of Ike and his times is in many ways so poignant and timely. The American people were, were uh, uh, mad as hell, you know, about things in general, mad as hell at one another. The nation was deeply divided. Sound familiar? Yes, mm -hmm. when Ike uh, ran for the presidency in 1952, that's the way it was. And a part of his self-chosen mission, and this is part of the reason why he projected that relaxed, genial, happy, sunny personality, was to deliberately help the nation calm down and become more unified. And it worked. Uh, he His leadership ushered in an age of good feelings such as the American people had not seen in, well, some time. Um, well, that that mission, you know, goes back to his childhood years. Um, his parents were both devoutly religious. They were members of a German uh, Mennonite sect called the River Brethren. Uh, like the Amish, they were pacifists. Um, both of his parents were. Um, they had that in common, but their personalities were, were very, very different, to put it mildly. His father, David, for whom he was initially named, <laughs> his father, David Eisenhower, was an angry man. Angry because of his personality, but angry for good reason due to the experiences he'd had in life. He'd been through some hard knocks. Uh, he'd experienced a long series of failures that left him angry and embittered. Uh, he became a very hard kind of father to love. He was distant and angry, whereas Ike's mother, Ida, was completely the reverse. She was witty, happy, charming, wonderful parent. Um, he really bonded with her. Not that he became a mama's boy, but he had to work hard to avoid becoming a mama's boy because he was drawn much more to her parental guidance than to his dad's. Uh, well, since his dad was a rather hard father to love, not all that surprisingly, Eisenhower went around Abilene as a kid looking for, how should we put it, 
male mentors, role models, you know, father figures. Not surprising. He found a whole series. Uh, uh, a rugged, rough and tumble guy named Bob Davis, uh, who, who taught him how to trap and hunt and camp out and cook out and play poker and bluff at poker, all the manly arts and taught him how to shoot and shooting practice, target practice became a big part of his routine before long. Um, Abilene, Kansas had been a violent, bloody town a generation before Ike was born in 1890. In the 1870s, Abilene was the center of the early Wild West. It was a very lawless, dangerous place, and it only became a safe place for decent people like the Eisenhowers to live in because of the valiant efforts of legendary lawmen like Wild Bill Hickok. Well, one of Ike's uh, teachers in target practice was a guy who said he'd been a deputy to Wild Bill. And I became a crack shot. Well, here now he's learning, you know, the fighting arts. He becomes interested in ancient military history. He's already on the path that will take him to West Point. And the mother he adores is a pacifist. And it breaks her heart. You know, the, the day in 1910, he leaves for West Point. She says, stoically, it's your choice. And then she goes to her bedroom and weeps. Oh. Uh, how does he reconcile um, this uh, this path forward that he's chosen with the ideals of the mother, well, it, it, it dawned upon me. I can't prove it, but it figures. It makes sense. He would learn the fighting arts, but then use those fighting arts to deliver his mother's fondest wish. Peace. Right. Right. And there you have it. I, I don't think it was a conscious choice. I think it was probably unconscious, but way down deep. This became the way he reconciled these, these, uh, opposite sides of the life that he was living. And it just carried forward down the decades to his presidency. That's what I, I think. I wanted to take a quick aside here because when I was reading the book, um, his brother came here to the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor. Edgar. A Edgar, right. And that, that, uh, that uh, Ike had actually contemplated coming to school here. For yes. A, probably a millisecond. And um, in, the, in your book, and again, we're talking with Richard Strine, the book is, Ike and Love and War, and uh, he and his brother double dated, and they went out on canoes in the Huron River. For those of you that are listening here locally, I just found that was really kind of cool. Oh yes, yes it was. And he went, and then from, from here he went to West Point. So, so but let's... the official plan was to go to the University of Michigan, and uh, his brother and he would would switch off. They would trade places. Uh, one of the brothers would earn money to pay for the other and then they would switch roles for a while and if i could continued um there were many people in his high school graduating class who predicted he would become a history professor might well have done you know if if he had not made that decision to go to a military academy but i think it was already foreordained you know that that fate was one that he had chosen mm -hmm. uh, in early childhood i think the idea of do. um we need to take a, a break here for a minute. And so I'm just going to kind of fill in some time here while we get set to run our little commercials. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Eisenhower going off to West Point, where it turns out he really wasn't the best student in the history right. of, the, of the academy. So you're listening to Veterans Radio. We'll be right back after this. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Walter Ellers and his brother were in the first wave to hit Omaha Beach on D-Day. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. Staff Sergeant Eller's brother was several hundred yards away on the beach, and they didn't see each other. Eller's unit ran into a decimated unit of Bangalore torpedo men and provided cover for them as they used their explosives to blow a hole in the German fortifications. This allowed an American breakup. On June 9th, Eller's platoon came under heavy fire. He climbed a hedgerow and called his men to follow. He spotted a German patrol and killed four of the enemy. Ordering his men to fix bayonets and firing from his hip, he destroyed a machine gun nest. 
He then attacked a second machine gun, killing three more. The platoon moved out the next morning and came under intense fire from both sides. The commander ordered a withdrawal. Ehlers realized that someone had to provide cover. He motioned his automatic rifleman to follow him, scrambled to the top of a mound of earth that provided a vantage point. They began firing on the Germans, drawing fire away from the rest of the platoon. Ehlers was hit in the back, but was able to kill the sniper that shot him. When his rifleman was wounded, Ehlers dragged him to safety. Ehlers was treated at a field station and insisted on returning to action. Unable to strap on a backpack, he strapped on two bandoliers of ammunition, picked up a rifle, and went to find his men. A month later, he was informed that his brother was killed on Omaha Beach. Ehlers was presented the Medal of Honor by Lieutenant General John Lee on December 19, 1944. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. If you were exposed to toxic substances in the military, a new law called the PACT Act may make you eligible for extra benefits and care. The PACT Act benefits veterans of the Vietnam, Gulf War, and post-9-11 eras. Learn more at va.gov slash pact or call 1-800-MY-VA-411. Residential Home Health and Hospice provides elite home health and hospice services. With operations across the entire state of Michigan and several other states, Residential delivers exceptional health care services, including in-home nursing and therapy, pain management, and hospice end-of-life support. Residential Home Health and Hospice is a proud veteran supporter and Level 5 partner in the We Honor Veterans Program, a program developed by the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization in collaboration with the Department of Veteran Affairs. This program places an emphasis on respectful inquiry, compassionate listening, and grateful acknowledgement for veterans across the country. Residential's involvement with We Honor Veterans is designed to provide specialized, compassionate care for our nation's heroes. Their dedicated team is trained to address the specific physical and emotional challenges that veterans may face. But it's not just about medical care. The We Honor Veterans program also focuses on enhancing veterans' quality of life. They understand that every veteran deserves to live their life to the fullest, surrounded by the support and respect they've earned. So, if you or a loved one is a veteran in need of specialized care and support, reach out to Residential Home Health and Hospice today. You have sacrificed so much for our country, and Residential ensures you receive proper care and respect. Let them show you what it means to truly care for and honor our veterans. Call 866-902-5854 or visit www.residentialhealthcaregroup.com to learn more. That's 866-902-5854 or visit www.residentialhealthcaregroup.com. Residential Home Health and Hospice, care where you are. We're back here on Veterans Radio, and our guest today is Richard Streiner. His book is titled Ike and Love and War, and we already kind of talked about his childhood and how he ended up at the um, military academy in West Point. But now I want to talk a little bit about his time spent there. So, Richard, tell me about uh, what happened after Ike arrived at West Point. Well, he uh, was not the best of students, and uh, in my opinion, his uh, rebelliousness, he piled up a record number of, of demerits. He was always pulling pranks, uh, goofing off. But part of it uh, really flowed from the lackluster teaching methods that were employed in those days at West Point. Uh, Eisenhower had a brilliant mind, a strategic mind. He had already uh, become deeply interested in ancient military history, Um but the teaching methods at West Point in those days were uh, just antediluvian, pedantic. Uh, teaching methods, you know, at many levels were like that. He was bored stiff in elementary school. I can tell you as a teacher myself, reading his accounts of the kind of teaching he received, I think he was right to feel bored. I would have felt bored too. In fact, 
I'll confess to you that I was bored stiff in high school. I hated high school, couldn't wait to get out. And then I become a history professor. Now what's wrong, you know, with that picture, the teaching methods, that's what was wrong. Um, I mean, at West Point, when, when they, uh, the subject uh, for discussion was the Battle of Gettysburg. This is according to Ike's own account. Instead of talking about the strategic contingencies, you know, the, the choices that confronted Lee and Meade, uh, number of options that were open to them, the risk factors and so on, uh, they didn't get into any of that. Nothing that would be useful, you know, in the art of war. Instead, it's this miserable, grueling lesson in memorizing the name of every officer and every unit at each hour of the day. Is it any wonder that that he rebelled and played poker and immersed himself in sports and chasing girls and so on? I would have done the same thing. <laughs> yeah, Not surprising no, at all. You know, it's history is is uh, I don't know. History has always been fascinating to me because I had uh, teachers that really brought it alive, you know, and they didn't just. That's it. Just, now you're you know, talking. No, we didn't That's what I tried to do in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, I tried to make it interesting and fun. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Uh, for myself and the students, you know, uh, a stimulating experience. And we had a great time. Uh, yeah. Now, Eisenhower didn't really begin to get the kind of instruction he deserved until the 1920s when he was in the Panama Canal Zone, you know, assigned to a remarkable general named Fox Connor. Uh, who was, uh, a gentleman scholar, very, very learned man. Um, and also, uh, kind of a, uh, self-selected talent scout for the high command because in the 1920s, after World War I, it was clear to a number of people, including this, uh, uh officer that another world war was very, very likely. And so Fox Connor, uh, had, had made it a part of his job description to be, uh, on the lookout for young officers with, with command promise, uh, to put them, you know, on an upwardly mobile path into the high command. And that's exactly what he did, uh, Fox Connor. Um, uh, an all too little known figure, uh, among the general public, you know, among the, the great military men of that age. And Fox Connor might have lived to become a famous general in World War II, but but the age, uh, his age wasn't quite right for that. By the time World War II uh, broke out, uh, Connor was far too old. But he had chosen well, you know, in the young protégés whom he groomed, including Eisenhower. One of the things that I found is, you know, that Eisenhower uh, never really appeared to be that ambitious. And things kind of... People notice them, you know, like like you just mentioned, that, that particular general says, hey, this guy, this young officer is really talented. Let's do this with him. Let's move him up here to this level and let's get him, you know, to the war college or, you know, because you meant, I know in the book you mentioned uh, that he went to, uh, what was it called, industrial? The, what was uh, then the Army Industrial College? That was it renamed name. the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and, and now it's got an even newer name. Uh, and part of that new name is Eisenhower's name because it's named in honor of him. Uh, it was created in the 1920s to provide uh, uh, army um, uh, staff with instruction in not only logistics in general, but the kind of uh, logistics that would be useful in a future mobilization. Um, because in World War I, there had been uh, so little, such insufficient uh, planning for a mobilization that when the United States declared war in April 1917, uh, everything was was grievously, you know, behind the curve. A lot of the fault for that was the fault of President Woodrow Wilson, a terrible strategist, a non-strategist, a man who lived. I wrote a book on Wilson's wartime leadership. I think he was a catastrophically bad uh, war leader. Part of the problem was his his lack of foresight, his his lack of contingency planning. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, when World War One broke out in 1914, was pleading with Wilson to begin, you know, preparation for mobilization. Wilson refused. That's warmongering talk. Well, yeah. uh, in the 20s, a lot of people were thinking that steps should be taken to prevent a repeat, you know, performance of that fiasco. 
So uh, this was a part of Eisenhower's training. He became a wizard, you know, in, of logistics by the time he went to work for Douglas MacArthur in the 1930s when MacArthur was Army Chief of Staff. Right, yes, he was continued to step up there. I wanted to just kind of go back a little bit and um he he came became friends with um Patton. And yes. the idea that these two whose history was really going to start showing up, you know, 20 years later, didn't they they took a part of tank? They did. Because we didn't have any tanks in World War 1. Well, the tank was was a new, you know, um all-terrain uh, fighting vehicle. The idea behind it had been under development for some time, uh, but it wasn't until World War I that, that the first effective tanks were created, and, and a number of, of officers uh, became specialists in, in the, uh, the strategy and tactics for tank warfare. Uh, George Patton was one of them. Uh, Charles de Gaulle was another. Heinz Guderian in, in Germany was another, uh, Erwin Rommel, you know, the, this cast of characters who would loom large in World War II. Uh, uh, Eisenhower developed tank expertise because he was assigned to develop a training camp in tank warfare, uh, right on the, the old Gettysburg battlefield in, in Pennsylvania, Camp Colt, it was called. Um, the old battlefield was still the property of the War Department. National Park Service had only been created two years earlier in 1916. And, you know, Gettysburg wouldn't be merged into National Park Service as a battlefield park until later. Uh, so this was land that the Army owned. And uh, anyway, uh, Eisenhower set the place up. And then uh, after uh, uh, the armistice, um, he was assigned by the Army to uh, do further work with tank warfare. This time at at uh, Camp Meade, you know today's Fort Meade in 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 Maryland, and Patton was with him there, and they became buddies, uh, Ike and Patton. Uh, one of the things they had in common was expertise in tank warfare. Patton had uh, commanded uh, the tanks uh, on the battlefields of France in 1918. Ike had prepared the men to use the tanks. And so they, they got together, uh, quickly and they developed these new theories of, of tank warfare, the, the, uh, the role the tank could play in future wars. And as, as you know from reading the book, they were both reprimanded and slapped down for it. They were told, don't you dare right. question these official doctrines with visionary theories. <laughs> but that, was, that seemed to be a case about a lot of things. You mean, you know, I, I don't want to miss out because we've only got about 10 minutes or so to go. Is that, um, you know, during the, between the wars, he, you know, he was with, with, uh, MacArthur. He really didn't, um, uh, have a good opinion of, of MacArthur. Cause by you know, the end, he hated him. At first, he was awestruck by the dazzling reputation and swagger of Douglas MacArthur, but I came to despise him, uh, uh serving under him in the Philippines in the 1930s. Well, yeah, MacArthur evidently had a, had a slight ego. <laughs> uh, to say the least. <laughs> you can say that. Well, let's uh, I, let's get him into World War II here. How did how did how did Ike get to be the the, the overall commander of uh, Overlord? Well, his rise was meteoric, uh, uh, and in some ways he was lucky to have been in the right place at the right times. But he demonstrated the kind of uh, brilliant efficiency, competence talent, leadership flair uh, in the right places at the right times to get noticed and and promoted upward rapidly, uh, especially after um, Pearl Harbor. Um, he had uh, already come to the attention of George Catlett Marshall, uh, Army Chief of Staff, and, and uh, uh, Marshall had already, before the outbreak of World War II for the United States, been uh, uh, engaged in a uh, uh, desperately urgent uh, program to build up the strength of the army, which in 1940 was number 19 in the world, you know, uh, due to isolationism between the world wars. Again, you know, the United States in a state of supreme unpreparedness. And uh, 
Marshall's role was to play catch up and do it, you know, but quick, as they would have said in those days. And after Pearl Harbor, the task became particularly urgent. Uh, Eisenhower had come to Marshall's attention, so Marshall summoned him to Washington and gave him a little test, you know, to see how good he might be. Uh, I had been serving in the Philippines, so Marshall said, uh, I'm giving you a couple of hours to, to tell me what our general line of action should be in the Pacific Theater. You know, go to work. Oh. <laughs> and Eisenhower's answer was cogent. Uh, and then Marshall said, all right, I agree with you. Now it's your job to carry it out. Save the Philippines, you know, if you can. And that's how it started. Uh, within months, Ike was chief of war plans uh, under George Marshall. Um, Marshall and Ike were becoming a team. And, you know, as grand strategy shaped up in 42 and give and take between FDR and Churchill, the American High Command, the British High Command, the decision had to be made. Uh, what are the priorities? Uh, the priority was Europe first. The Nazis were perceived to be enemy. Uh, but the idea of a cross-channel invasion, you know, uh, full-scale mm -hmm. frontal attack in 42, uh, Marshall and the American high command were all for it. Uh, the Brits said, you're out of your minds. <laughs> you know, in effect, you know, we were, no way we're ready for that now. And FDR agreed, so uh, the decision was made to go into uh, North Africa, uh, the genesis of, of Operation Torch. Uh, Ike was placed in charge of that in part because Marshall um, was not very good at hiding his feelings, and, and he and other members of the American High Command um, still disagreed so vehemently with the British. Uh, Marshall continued to believe we need to do the cross-channel invasion now, this year, and he wouldn't stop. Uh, well, FDR decided to choose a man with more diplomatic, you know, <laughs> finesse who could, who could create a wartime coalition. And he chose right. Ike was perfect for that. And his success in North Africa led to FDR choosing him to command Operation Overlord. I think one of the things I want to point out to our audience is that in in uh, Richard Streiner's book, Ike and, and Love and War, it's that all of these things that we're talking about right now are in detail. I mean, really, I found fascinating detail about how these decisions were being made to do we go in, you know, cross channel? Do we go in, you know, through the underbelly? Do we go up through Sicily? And all of these things are are so well researched and made very interesting uh, to the reader, I think. And I mean, no, I wish we could, you know, talk all about those things. But I got to get them into the presidency here. I'd love to get into the presidency. And so let's talk about how this warrior, his ultimate goal was to maintain peace in the world during his terms. Peace, security, and safety in the dangerous new era of nuclear weapons. Ike was not the first president to face that. Harry Truman, of course, was. And Eisenhower was one in a sequence of early Cold War presidents who had to hammer out a whole new strategic architecture for national security uh, using the most uh, advanced uh, emerging technology, uh, developing the most... Uh, uh, advanced capabilities for uh, reconnaissance, um, developing a, a whole clandestine, you know, world of, of highly classified programs designed to prevent another Pearl Harbor, in this case, a nuclear surprise attack on America. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, and if you and your listeners will bear with me for a moment, I'm not going to get, you know, too much into today's politics. Don't worry. However, you know, uh, I've been interviewed, um, by other radio programs since my book was published last month. And, uh, some of the radio hosts have been avowedly, you know, conservative in, in their political affiliations. And they've always tended to lead off with Ike's warning about the military-industrial complex. Well, you know, that pertains to controversies now about, you know, USA to Ukraine and so on and so forth. Ike was uh, very much against isolationism. One of the reasons why he ran for the presidency in 52 was to prevent another pendulum swing back into isolationism. Uh, 
Um, but yes, it's true. Ike warned about the dangers of the military industrial complex. But the thing I point out immediately, if I can, is that he also helped to create it. He also helped to create it. And for good reason, for good reason. Uh, these clandestine programs, for example, the capacity for space-based reconnaissance, spy satellites, uh, uh, the the early developmental thinking uh, had started as early as around 1946, you know, in, in the Army Air Forces, soon to be the Air Force, the RAND Corporation, and so on, a long lead time. But Eisenhower made it happen, and it had to be, uh, you know, absolutely clandestine. Um, after the capability had been perfected in 1960, the satellite Corona 14 uh, achieved the breakthrough, you know, giving Eisenhower the, the top down view of the Soviet Union that could prove there was no missile gap. <laughs> All right. Um, Eisenhower began planning for the agency, which in 1961 would be created as National Reconnaissance Office, NRO. Well, it's, it's out there in the open now, but at first, it was an agency whose existence could not be, you know, acknowledged. The very name of the agency was classified. Like, uh, you know, National Security Agency, no such agency. They're out in the open now. Well, they couldn't be then. You know, talk about what people now call the deep state. All right. Hmm. Now, if Eisenhower and his legacy can be of use to the American people now, and this is not just true of Ike, but you know, I say this, I know, to an audience of veterans, the American military and the whole national security sector can be of great help to the American people, because in an age when uh, so many people complain they don't know whom to believe, they don't know whose word can be trusted, you have all these conspiracy theories, you know, running rampant. One thing that the legacy of national security that Eisenhower developed can teach is, is the need for reliable information, for proof, for verification, for dead on accurate, you know, capabilities to assess things. Uh, so you're, you know, you're not boxing with, you know, phantoms. Uh, you need to know your enemies, who your enemies are, what their real capabilities are. Uh, it is the the dependence upon debt on accurate, you know, in Eisenhower's case, scientific and technological, but it it, it it's part of a way of thinking that transcends such things. Uh, the cold, hard power of sheer analysis, the ability to step back, you mm -hmm. know, from our immediate passions and say, all right, let's just calm down, which is what Eisenhower did in his presidency. And let's let's just think this through and see what reliable information we have. Oh, yes. He warned about the military industrial complex because he had the kind of analytical mind that could see, you know, the fact that anything created by human hands can go wrong. So you've got to be alert on guard part of the mission of guardianship. Um, but you use that that razor sharp mind, you know, to analyze things. If there's one one point that I could share, you know, with Americans now about the Eisenhower legacy, it's that right now in particular that can be so helpful to Americans today. At least that's the way I see it. Well, I wish we had so much more time. We don't. Um, I'm only down to a minute. He's already given me signals here. But so we've been talking with Richard Stein of the book. It's Ike and Love and War. We left out the love part. We'll get it. You know, I think maybe I'll have to have you back on to talk about. I'd love to talk. I'd love to come back and talk about that. I thank you very much, Richard. This is a great story. I encourage our audiences to go out and get the book, especially those of you out there that are amateur historians. Great information. So thank you, Richard. The book thank is available you, everywhere. It's a great story, and I encourage people to read it, as I mentioned before. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. All right. Coming up next week is our benefits program, and we're going to be talking more about our new uh, sponsor, the residential folks. And uh, so make sure that you tune in. We're coming up to the end of the program. So this is Dale Thronberry for all of us here at Veterans Radio America. You are dismissed. While the storm clouds gather far across.
across the sea. Let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. God bless America. beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam God bless America my home Guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.